Join me once again in our unison scripture reading, which is taken from the 19th chapter of 1 Kings. And we will be reading together the first through the 15th verse, the opening clause, clause A. <clears throat> Ahab told Jezebel that all, all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not there in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return your way to the wilderness of Damascus. It's okay. It's all right. You know, it's tough when you're the, when you're the only one. So, um, in the story that we just read, there's this guy, Elijah, and he goes and hides out in, in a cave because he's mad at God. And God says, uh, go out to the mouth, mouth of the cave and uh, my presence will pass by. And there's this huge wind like a hurricane, right? And like trees are falling down and rocks are, are falling down from the mountains, but God is not in the wind. And then there's a huge earthquake. Have you ever been in an earthquake? Yeah, I, I uh, lived in, in a country where there was lots of earthquakes for a while. And, and gentle earthquakes go like, you, you kind of sway. But when, it goes up, when the number goes up and it's more, it's up and down and violent and really shakes you and can scare you. But God was not in the earthquake. And then there's fire, but God was not in the fire, which is interesting because in scripture, um, there's a different place where God speaks to another person, Job, out of a whirlwind, right? And there's Moses, Moses uh, God speaks to Moses from a burning bush that is not, that doesn't burn as it's burning, right? And so, but in this instance, we're told God is not in any of those things. And then there's this, it sound of sheer silence, right? And then God speaks to Elijah 
in the silence. And I was thinking about the ways that we pray. Because very often when we pray, and at the end, I always say, let's fold our hands, close our eyes, bow our heads. And that's kind of to try to center ourselves. We don't have to close our eyes to pray. We can pray with our eyes wide open. Um, but it's a way to kind of just focus. But sometimes we can and do all the talking. But God can speak to us in the silence. And somebody uh, told me about a way to, to enter into prayer with God. Can you think of somebody who gives like a really, really good hug? There, there are certain people who are just good huggers, right? And when they hug you, you're just like, oh, you just feel really loved. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do the adults, everybody know? There, there's, it's not everybody, but there are certain people when they give you a hug, you just like, oh, and it just makes you go, yes, right? Violet. Violet is a good hugger? Oh, really? She gives the best hugs? How sweet is that, right? What a gift, right? So this person who said, you know, when you go into, to pray with God, you, know, you can close your eyes and imagine that God is giving you like the best hug and you don't have to say anything. You just like, re- you just know that you are loved, right? And then rest in that. And then if you want to speak, you can. Or you can just say thank you, right? So something that you can think about. And, and you're not going to do it every time. But every once in a while, think about when you go to pray, let God give you a big hug, the best hug. And then if you have something to, you know, to share with God to, that you want to talk with God, you can do And that's what prayer is, right? Just talking with God um, to do that. And I encourage the adults as well to think about that. And you don't always have to talk. We can just rest and be with God. So now I'm going to say, let's hold our hands, close our eyes, bow our heads. And for everybody, just imagine that warm, loving embrace by God. Thank you, God, for loving us and for listening to us when we pray and for reminding us that we should sometimes be silent and listen for your voice. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Scarlett, for being brave. All right. Mr. Dave is going to play some music, and then you are going to go out with Mrs. Walsh and your mom for Sunday school. Thank you for coming up. Our second scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8. Verses 26 through 39. Then they arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he, Jesus, stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these, so he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swineherds saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. 
And then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to, to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming through the city how much Jesus had done for him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So years ago, when I was a senior in seminary, and I, that, I can't believe how time flies, because it feels like yesterday. They had a comedy night. They called it Theola Giggle. And this story of the Gerasen uh, demoniac was told from the perspective of, of the swine herder. And I'll never forget it. So this, I'm not going to do it justice, but one of my classmates stood up and he said, there I am, minding my own business. And this Jesus comes to shore and he goes and talks with the crazy man in the tombs. And suddenly the crazy man's not crazy anymore. And people think we had a problem with that. We didn't have a problem with that. But again, there I am standing, minding my own business. And suddenly my entire herd starts running towards the lake. And there they go, one after the other, off the cliff, 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 one after the other. Yeah, we ran him out of town, but not by why you think. We ran him out of town because he's bad for business. My only question is this. Who's going to pay me for my pigs? You will never hear that story the same ever again. It was funny. I was, I was reading it. I'm like, I shouldn't be smiling. I should not be smiling. I love that these two stories are coupled together in the lectionary. From the Hebrew scriptures, we have Elijah on Mount Horeb, which is the same as Mount Sinai, and we have Jesus up on the cliffs with the Gerasene demoniac. Both men are isolated. Elijah chooses seclusion because he's afraid of people, and the Gerasene demoniac is where he is because the people are afraid of him. Can you think of a time when you feel have felt isolated did you choose it yourself or was it imposed on you why you know i wrote that without thinking about covid at all and then when i was practicing i realized oh my gosh some people have really felt this uh many of us we were you know secluded or with with family which had its own challenges to be together but a lot of folks were isolated so this, I, you know, that, that question, can you think of a time when your eyes said, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. But there are other times in life when we can feel isolated, sometimes by choice or sometimes it's imposed on us. I realized I am, I am struggling to write a letter to a former parishioner who lost a son. And I realized it's, you know, because I can think there's no words, and that's what I need to write to her. There are no words, but know that I'm praying for you. That is the letter that I, that I will write. But very often we can become isolated because of some tragedy in our lives, and I know that there are folks here who have experienced this, that people don't know what to say, and you can feel isolated when you really need folks. In both of these stories, the men are returned to community. That Jesus would interact with this, with this man goes against custom. He's, uh, he's living in the tombs, which would make him unclean. And a devout Jew would not interact with somebody who was unclean because they would become unclean and not be able to participate in rituals. But Jesus is a healer. And he has, he has just calmed the storm with the disciples. That comes right before this in all of the Gospels. Even the wind and the waves obey him, right? And he now calms the storm in this man. For Elijah, it's a different kind of storm. In a, with Elijah, he has holed up in a cave, and God tells him to go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. 
And there's a lot in this story to liken Elijah to Moses. Moses, in, in, we read, is hidden in the cleft of, of a mountain while the presence of the Lord passes by. Elijah is holed up in the cave and told to go look, but we don't read that Elijah got up. Elijah was not interested. Elijah was mad at God. We might paraphrase, paraphrase his complaints to God. I have done so much for you and for you to let this happen to me. No. Have you ever had a thought like that? Or maybe, what did I do to deserve this? Or I have given my life to you and you would let this happen to me. (laughs) I don't think they say this anymore, but talk to the hand, God. Talk to the hand. And while Elijah sat, there was a strong wind that split the mountains. There was a, an earthquake. There was a fire. And Elijah did not move. And then there was a sound of sheer silence. And the translation is tricky there. there. It could be a gentle little breeze. It could be the sound of a light whisper or the traditional still small voice. But what if, however, it was a sound of sheer silence? Because there's always noise. There's bugs and birds and twigs that snap or a breeze that makes the leaves whisper to one another. The sheer silence spoke to him, and he got up. And with the world's noise paused, God says to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah repeats his complaint. All these bad things are happening to me after I have been so zealous for you. God does not apologize or explain or try to reason with Elijah. just tells him to get up. Go, return, and when you arrive... I have a list of things for you to do. The Gerasene demoniac, after being healed, offers to follow Jesus, but instead he's sent out to be an apostle, to tell people all that God has done for him. And then we read that he declares all that Jesus has done for him. And right there, the the theologians who who sat with the story of Jesus and scripture, Luke lays it out right that, that we've just gone through Trinity Sunday or we've just experienced Trinity Sunday right there. Jesus is God. Elijah is restored to community by God. The garrison man is restored to community by God, Jesus. But what glimpses do we have of the larger community in these stories? For Elijah, we have the angel who brings him food. And it's interesting. The lectionary passage um, does not include those three verses. They're optional, but I think they're key because sometimes the way that God shows up is by offering food. This is my body broken for you. But it can also be the person who shows up on your doorstep with a casserole or a pie. Does anybody make casseroles anymore? You used to have a casserole dish. You know, when I think of casserole, I think of mayonnaise and cheese. Maybe we don't do casseroles anymore because maybe we do grilled chicken and, and steamed vegetables. I don't know. But the secret, the secret spice to that dish that's delivered is love, prayers, faith. Get up and eat, said the angel. In the story of the garrison, this man was isolated because of his violent behavior, but, but they kept watch, we read. Somebody had to have fed him. Years ago, I was hiking, and I saw a sign posted on, on the side of the road. And, it, and I'm paraphrasing because uh, I don't have the sign with me. So I, it was something like this. Matthew, it's time to come home. This is the last week we will deliver meals. You've been gone too long. Come home to your bed. We love you, but we can't go on like this. And I can't be the only hiker 
who said a prayer for Matthew and his family. They were looking out for him. In the version of the Gerasene demoniac in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus tells him, go home to your friends. He had community. People were looking out for him. He was not wholly cut off. Now, what I'm about to say I think is really interesting take on on this passage, and I think extremely relevant, but I'm not going to dive too deeply into it. Scholars are struck by the name Legion, that he's called Legion, because Legion is a military term which points a finger at the Roman Empire. A legion is somewhere between 3,000 and 600 soldiers. So the idea of being occupied rather than possessed. This passage might be an indictment of violence. Once the legion left the man, what did they do? They entered the swine who, or the pigs, who run off the, the cliff and kill themselves immediately. We can think of the tortured souls who have seen too much violence, who have witnessed too many atrocities, and their souls have been offended because no one should have to be a party to such horror. We glorify our military heroes, but we also need to recognize that war is hell. And this passage might ask us as a community, how do we minister to people who are experiencing PTSD? How do, we, how do we help break the chains of, of, of nightmares and the desire for a return to innocence? What is the bread that we can offer? How can we help God in the healing? This passage might enlist us to, to be mindful and show up for those who have enlisted for us. So I plant that seed. How might we do that? You will notice in this passage that both men, once restored to relationship, are called to serve. We are all saved to serve. And I uh, was listening to a, a, a video of a pastor saying, saved people serve. Boom. Period. Get up, Elijah. I've got a list. Go, child of God. Go back to your people and share your story. Tell them that all, all that God has done for you. And to you and me, what is God whispering to you in the silence? How has God called you to serve? Who needs to hear the story of your salvation? A man shared his faith with me this week in the grocery store. I was standing at the deli counter. And I, I, you know, I struck up the conversation. He ordered the broccoli rob salad. And I'm like, broccoli rob, Really? And he goes, he goes, no. And I'm like, yeah, I had it once at a restaurant. Not really my thing. He's like, like, and he said, just once. I'm like, I know. I should give it another shot. But, and, and then it, it went on from there where he was telling me that his key to long life was to have one salad a day that had seven different vegetables in it. And you need, uh, he, I think if he'd, he would love that I'm sharing this with you. Uh, it had seven vegetables in it, and you need to have an herbal tea every afternoon so that your body can absorb the minerals. And he's telling me, he goes, this is my key to long life. And he says with a smile, and you need to believe in Jesus Christ. And I smiled back, and I said, I'm a pastor. Rock on. Thank you for sharing that. And it was done so sweetly and so genuinely. I consider that incredibly brave. I have never been called to share my faith with anyone at the deli counter. There are times where I have felt the Holy Spirit nudging me to say, can I pray with you as a way to share my faith? And talking about sharing faith, at session the other night, we were, we were talking, we were saying a, a praise God for, for Sunday school and for our volunteers, for Jody and Heather and Lily. And, and, and I shared something that I had been taught years ago. It's less important whether the kids remember all the Bible stories that they're being taught than the feeling that they have coming to church and being with the community. Because when they grow up and get older and decide to drift away, possibly, maybe. Think about yourself. 
the hope is they will think of a time in their life where they felt loved, where they felt peace, where they felt accepted, where they were you know, surrounded by a community of faith who were just there to, to love on them and encourage them to grow and be their best, at, you know, their best people. And the prayer is that they would return and check out a church wherever they're living. Community is such a gift. The world is starved for it. Loneliness is rampant. And we have this thing called church. We pray that people might come to know faith here, but we offer friendship. To quote one of the commentators of scripture that I read this week, salvation is social. You are not alone. God is in the silence. God is in the wilderness. God is in the cave. God is with us. Where there are two or three gathered in community, God is there. Take a deep breath. May you see God this week. May you hear God this week. May you share God's love in the breaking of the bread or in breaking of bread. And don't forget, God has a list of things for you to do. In Jesus' name, amen.